uh, welcome everybody uh, to tonight's uh, discussion. Um, what I do monthly is have these uh, public uh, meetings on the kidney uh, to uh, educate those of you on the call um, about the kidney and uh, its various diseases and how you can get your kidney function monitored. And at the end of the discussion, I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have about your own health that you might know. So this first slide shows the two kidneys. They're situated uh, in the back uh, near the upper part of the abdomen. And they each weigh about a third of a pound. Now, a common question that comes up is if you have a kidney transplant, what happens to your native kidneys? And the answer is they're left inside. And so you end up having three kidneys, actually. The two kidneys shown here that are not functioning that well, and then the transplanted kidney. So that's a pretty common question. And the reason for leaving those kidneys in is the kidney, even though the kidneys, even though they have some disease and are not functioning well, they still make certain hormones like vitamin D, the activated form of vitamin D, and they also make another hormone called erythropoietin that prevents you from becoming anemic. Now, this slide is an important slide because of what it shows, um, men and women are in different colors here, but they, they track pretty equally. But what this shows is that as you age, your kidney function declines. So if normal is 100%, let's say at the age of 50, what you see is uh, as you get older, it's normal to have your kidney function decrease. And that's important because let's say you're 75 years old and you go to the doctor and the doctor says your kidney functions roughly 80% of normal. Well, you need to tell that doctor that's perfectly normal. You don't have a, you don't have a disease. You don't have anything wrong with your kidneys other than the normal effect of aging on the kidneys. Uh, just like aging elsewhere in the body. So it's very important to know what the normal kidney function should be for your particular age. When you're 50, it should be near 100% of normal, but there is an age-dependent decline in kidney function for a number of reasons, and that becomes the new normal. And doctors often make a mistake with this. Let's say you're 70 years old and you come into the doctor and he says, oh, uh, your EGFR or your kidney function is, is 80 and you have a certain CKD stage. Well, that's not true. You're having kidney function of 80, which is 20% less than normal, does not represent abnormality. It's perfectly normal. And yes, it's not 100% of normal, but we don't call that a disease. And so often the doctors have to be reminded because sometimes they think there's something going on in the kidney and they will do additional tests. So it's important for you to be aware because most doctors aren't aware of this. If you do have true problems with your kidney, there's a test that you'll get from your blood work called the EGFR. And depending on what the level of the EGFR is on the test, you are defined as having different CKD stages. So CKD stands for chronic kidney disease. And depending on what your EGFR test is, it'll put you into different CKD stages. So if your EGFR, let's say, is between 60 and 89, that means you're, you will be defined as having CKD stage two. If your EGFR is under 15, you'll have CKD stage five. Now, sometimes you progress if you have an abnormality in the kidney, no matter what the cause, from, from CKD1 to CKD5. The rate at which that happens varies between different people, and it also depends on what the cause is of the kidney disease to begin with. Other people who have a certain CKD stage can stay there the rest of, your, of their life. So if you're CKD2, let's say now, you can spend another 20, 30 year, years till the end of your life at CKD stage two. What we try to prevent as kidney doctors is for a patient to progress from one to five. If your CKD stage gets to this kind of level or your EGFR gets to about 15 or 20, let's say, you're getting close to needing what we call renal replacement therapy, which means we need to do something to take over the function of the kidney. And this could be a kidney transplant or it could mean you need to go on dialysis, but we can't 
let you stay at this kind of level because there are many things that occur at this level that are not good for your health. But if your CKD stage is two or three or even four, you tend not to have symptoms and you can still function rather normally without needing renal replacement therapy. So if you think about it, you need to get down to about 10 or 15% of your original kidney function before the doctor needs to do something more drastic, which we call in general renal replacement therapy. And that again means either a transplant or some form of dialysis. We cannot, there are currently no pills that we can give you to take you from stage four or five CKD back to the original stages that you were early on. That's That falls into the research realm. Now, what is the blood test that allows the doctor to determine what your EGFR is and what your CKD stage is? The blood test is called creatinine. It's a simple test that's measured whenever you get your blood tested. Usually you don't have to ask for it specifically. It's part of the regular chemistry panel. And the normal level is about one. So if your creatinine is one, you have approximately 100% of your kidney function. Or in other words, your EGFR is going to be near 100. But if the creatinine goes from one to two, you've lost half of your kidney function and your EGFR will be around 50. And if the creatinine goes from one to four, you have a quarter of your kidney function left and your EGFR will be around 25. So the creatinine is the key blood test that the EGFR report is based on and that the CKD staging is based on. It's all based on what your creatinine is. So it's very important that if you have a problem with your kidneys, you get your creatinine measured to make sure it's not going higher and higher and higher, which means your EGFR is dropping and your CKD stage is getting worse. And if you've never had it measured, it's important to know what your kidney function is. And the problem is many people don't know what their creatinine is. They have no idea what their kidney function is because people tend to only get it measured for major events um, or if they have something going on uh, with their health, they'll get a creatinine measured. And oftentimes it's found to be elevated and people weren't even aware they had a kidney problem. So it's important in your early 20s to start knowing what your creatinine is and follow it for the rest of your life. Because if you can pick up the abnormality early on, you can prevent oftentimes the kidney function from getting worse over time by stopping the initial insult that was causing the abnormal kidney function to begin with. But if you pick it up when it's too late, oftentimes you can't do anything about it. And inevitably, the kidney function will further decline and you'll end up potentially needing a transplant or dialysis. So when the kidneys don't function normally, you tend to retain salt. Kidneys are very important for getting rid of salt that you eat. So when you have salt from your diet, the kidneys recognize how much salt you're taking in and they get rid of that salt. And the reason it's important for the kidney to do that is salt is one of the determinants of your blood pressure. In fact, as you ingest more salt, then you can excrete and you start retaining salt, your blood pressure goes up. And you can really make someone's blood pressure whatever you want just by having them eat more salt uh, that they can't excrete. If you can excrete the salt you're taking in, your blood pressure won't go up. The other important determinant is how much water you're getting rid of. So the kidneys get rid of water. And if the kidneys aren't working well, you retain the water that you're ingesting and that will make your blood pressure uh, go up. The reason salt does it is salt causes you to retain water and makes you thirstier when you drink water. So the, the bottom line is how much water is staying in your body. That's really the determinant of your blood, one, one of the determinants of your blood pressure. And salt secondarily affects how much water you keep in your body. Now, a very common question is, how much water should I drink? And that's a complicated question. And I'm gonna give an answer which probably you're not used to and that you, that you find somewhat complicated. but 
The amount of water you need to drink, assuming you're not sweating and losing water excessively, is approximately equal to how much water your kidney gets rid of if your water intake was zero. So I know that's a hard answer, but let's say you go on a zero water intake. Your kidneys are going to still get rid of some water. They'll cut back on the, how much water they're getting rid of. The urine will look very yellow because it's concentrated. And that's the amount of water you need to drink. You need to match what the minimum amount of water your kidney can put out is. Now, there is additional water lost in your breath, and there is additional water lost from your skin. But just as a rough guide, you need to match what the kidney would put out if your intake is zero. Now, that's about two or 300 milliliters a day. It's about a cup of water a day. Now, why do we drink more than that? Well, we drink more than that for many reasons. One, it's popular now to tell people how much water they should drink. And that is not based on a lot of data. So there's a lot of misinformation about how much water people should drink or are told to drink. And I'm not talking about someone who exercises. That's a very different story where you would lose much more water through sweating than just the loss from your kidneys. And you have to, you have to make up for that and match that. So your water intake has to be greater than someone who's more sedentary. Um, but if you think about it, if you're drinking more than the minimum amount your kidneys put out, you're really driving the system. So if your kidneys put out, let's say, a glass of water a day when your intake is zero and you're drinking four or five or six glasses a day, you're making the kidney get rid of more water than it would do otherwise, which is fine. You just shouldn't think, based on all the magazines you read and everything you hear on TV and from other people, that that water is staying inside you and somehow making you healthy. When you drink your bottle of Perrier water, it's actually coming out in, into the toilet in the form of urine, and it'll take maybe three, four hours. So it doesn't stay in your body very long. And that's true of coffee, tea, um, water from the tap. It doesn't matter. The kidneys recognize that you've had water to drink and they'll get rid of it. So as long as you're aware of that, then it's not a problem to go ahead and drink more than that minimal amount. But don't feel that you're doing something healthy for your body because that data just is not there. Now, I'm not talking about someone with kidney disease, and I'm not talking about people that exercise a lot. That's a very different um, story. And again, the kidney doesn't care what form the water is in. When I say water, I'm really using a term that could be referred to as your total fluid intake, which is soup, coffee, tea, water, juice, milk in your cereal it doesn't matter the kidney doesn't care where the water came from it will recognize it and get rid of it now if the kidney doesn't get rid of it then this is going to happen you're going to start retaining fluids and what we have to do is either cut back on your water intake or we have to somehow make the kidney get rid of more water which we can do with pills that are called diuretics that you may have heard but they only work when the kidney function is not severely impaired if you have severe kidney uh, disease, diuretics don't work. And the only thing we can do really is cut back on your intake. And if that doesn't work, we then have to think, well, the kidney function is bad enough that you may need renal replacement therapy like a transplant uh, or dialysis. One of the things we do on dialysis is we remove the excess fluid that your kidneys couldn't get rid of. So the kidneys are very important for controlling your blood pressure because they determine from the salt and the water that you take in in your diet, how much salt and water you excrete. And as long as you're matching your dietary intake, you're going to be fine from the salt and water point of view. Now, there are other reasons for high blood pressure that have nothing to do with how much water is in your body. That has to do with how constricted your blood vessels are. The more they constrict, independent of how much water is in your body, your blood pressure can go up. So we sort of divide high blood pressure into those patients that have blood vessels that are too narrow, and other patients that have too much fluid in their body. And it could be a combination of both. And the pills we give target either the blood vessels themselves, if they're too narrow, or we try to get rid of the fluid in your body, either by cutting back on the intake or increasing the amount you lose through your kidneys. Now, 45% of Americans age 18 and older have a high blood pressure as defined in greater than 130 over 80. 
And it's, you know, most of these people don't even recognize they have it because you don't have any symptoms when you have high blood pressure in general. However, if your blood pressure is too high for a very long period of time, it can affect your heart, it can affect your brain, uh, and sometimes it can affect the kidney. So it's important to know what your blood pressure is. And again, even in your 20s, you should know what your blood pressure is and you should keep it normal throughout your whole life. Because if you don't, you're just adding another um, uh, effect on your body that you shouldn't have to deal with. Unfortunately, most people don't know what their blood pressure is, nor do they try to keep it in the normal range. Now, blood pressure is like the weather. It changes from minute to minute throughout the day. So if you do happen to have a cuff, Measuring it once a day only gives you part of the story. Even if your blood pressure, let's say, is normal at 10 in the morning, it doesn't mean it's normal at 2 in the afternoon or at 10 o'clock at night. So what you want to do, if you have a blood pressure cuff, at least initially, when you first get it, is make sure that your blood pressure is normal throughout the day. Now, obviously, you're not measuring it in the middle of the night. If you want to, you can do that, too. Some people only have high blood pressure in the middle of the night. So it's important to, initially to get a rough idea of uh, what it is throughout a 24-hour period, and then target the times that it's high and not the other times. And we recommend to everybody to keep a log or an Excel spreadsheet when you first get a blood pressure cuff. Get a rough idea uh, over a week what your blood pressures are, and then that's what you take into the doctor. We tend not to care about what your blood pressure is in the doctor's office because there's something called white coat syndrome, where your blood pressure is usually much higher in the office because you're so nervous. So it's more important for you and for us to know when it is at home and also to document it. And then you take that log in when you go see your doctor, whether it's your GP or primary care doctor or cardiologist or nephrologist, you should always bring in your data so that they can make their assessment and then their decisions based on um, the numbers you get at home. Now, the other thing that affects the blood pressure, in, in addition to the time of day that you measured it, is how the position that you were in when you measured it, because blood pressure is different when you're lying, sitting, or standing. And so it's important to measure it the same in the same position all the time. Don't, in the morning, measure it standing, and in the afternoon, measure it sitting, that kind of thing. Now, there are some patients who have a drop in their blood pressure. So it's sort of the opposite, only when they're standing, tend to be people, older people who are on blood pressure pills. So the blood pressure may be fine. Well, let's say they initially had high blood pressure. We put them on a blood pressure pill. Now the blood pressure is normal lying or sitting, but as soon as they stand up, it drops excessively and can cause lightheadedness and can actually sometimes cause people to fall uh, and break a hip. So it's important if you're on a blood pressure pill, to make sure that it doesn't fall uh, excessively when you first stand up and you can measure it standing and sitting. And you'll know most of the time anyway, because you'll feel lightheaded. That's a clue that your blood pressure uh, fell to too low a level and the doctor needs to know that. Now, oftentimes we just tell the person you're resting or you're sitting, lying blood pressure is fine. When you get up, just get up slowly or sit on the edge of the bed and then wait till you feel that your lightheadedness goes away and then stand up. But don't just stand up and then start walking. This is important for people in their 70s and 80s and 90s because people tend to get up in the middle of the night to urinate. So, you know, my sort of adage is when you're in your 60s, you get up once. When you're in your 70s, you get up twice. In your 80s, you get up three times. But each of those times you get up, it's often dark. You can't see very well. You might get up quickly and you can fall. And so... Um, when you're falling in, in your 70s and 80s and 90s, you're more prone to losing your balance and possibly breaking a hip. So it's important to be very careful if you're on blood pressure pills when you first get up. But everybody 20 and older should know what their blood pressure is and get on medication if it's high. There are many, many, many diseases that can affect the blood pressure. And so the doctor not only needs to diagnose that it's normal or elevated, but if it is elevated, figure out why it's elevated. The pills that you go on also differ depending on whether it targets the blood vessel narrowing or the volume overload or the excess fluid in your body, but also the timing of the pills important because the pills 
don't start working right away and they don't last the whole day. So if you have high blood pressure, let's say first thing in the morning, the doctor may give you a pill before you go to bed. It'll start working two to three hours later and maybe and work maybe for 12 to 15 hours. Sometimes you can go on a long acting uh, 24 hour blood pressure pill. But again, that's not the best treatment if your blood pressure is normal part of the day because then the pill will make it lower than normal. So it's best to, in, in most patients, to have shorter acting pills and target when you take the pill based on when your blood pressure was elevated. The kidney also, as I said, makes this hormone called erythropoietin, and erythropoietin uh, goes to the bone marrow and then tells the bone marrow to make your red blood cells. So when you when the kidney is not working well, you don't have as much erythropoietin, and there's not as enough of a signal to go to the bone to make red blood cells. So the lack of sufficient red blood cells is what we call anemia, and that's your hemoglobin level. So patients who have severe kidney disease or CKD four or five often need erythropoietin to prevent them from getting anemic. And almost every patient on dialysis is on erythropoietin because they have a severe, such a severe loss of kidney function and ability to make erythropoietin. So another way we test for uh, kidney abnormalities is not just the creatinine, which we use to give you your EGFR and your CKD stage. We also look at the urine protein. And when the kidney gets diseased, there's more protein in the urine than there normally is. And we use this color-coded stick that we stick in the urine. And depending on the color, it'll tell us there's more and more or less and less protein in the urine. Now, the protein we typically look for is called albumin. Albumin is the protein in egg white. So when you're eating egg white, you're eating pure albumin. And that protein is not found in the urine in normal people. But when you get different kidney diseases, there's more and more albumin in the urine. We call That's called proteinuria. It means protein in the urine. But the protein that it's referring to is uh, albumin most of the time. In addition, the urine can have blood in it. Typically, the urine looks clear like this. When it's more concentrated, it could be yellow. But you shouldn't see pink or red urine. If you do, that means there's red blood cells in the urine, these things that are normally in blood that the bone marrow is making don't get into the urine. But if you have abnormal kidneys, sometimes the blood can get into the urine, and that's a clue that there's something going wrong with the kidney. Now, if there's blood in the urine, it doesn't mean the kidney is the source. It could be the prostate gland in a man. It could be your bladder. You could have a tumor in your bladder that's doing it. Uh, you can have kidney stones that are higher up in the urinary tract that are doing it, or it could be the kidney tissue itself. So the doctor needs to find out what the source of the blood is. Now, even in urine that's clear like this, you could still have a small amount of blood. You just can't see it with your eyes, and we will then look under the microscope at any urine to see if there's red blood cells in the urine that we can pick up. The urine can also have bacteria, which means you have an infection because there's never bacteria in normal urine. This usually occurs in sexually active uh, women in their 20s or 30s, and the usual symptoms are burning or urinating a lot. We call that frequency. Doesn't mean you have a lot of urine, just you're going to the bathroom a lot. So we'll look at the urine, we'll see if there's bacteria there. We'll also do what's called a culture where we take the urine and put it on this what's called agar plate. And this plate has food for the bacteria. It's sort of like a solid gel. And if there's bacteria in the urine, we'll get these little round colonies of bacteria. And then the lab will put antibiotics around these to see what antibiotics will kill the particular bacteria. Initially, we don't have this back. This can take 48 to 72 hours. So if the doctor sees this, or even just from the symptoms alone in a young woman, it's 95% of the time urinary tract infection, the doctor will prescribe an antibiotic for seven to 10 days. And it's a guess because we don't know for sure that the antibiotic is going to work, but usually if it does, the symptoms will clear up within the day. And so even without the culture and the antibiotic sensitivities, we know it's working. If the symptoms continue, 
the doctor might try to switch antibiotics even before getting this back. But when, when this comes back, it's usually confirmatory that the antibiotic that was given is correct. Now, sometimes it's not a simple urinary tract infection and the bacteria can go all the way up uh, into the kidneys. And then you have another problem called pyelonephritis, which is much more dangerous and severe where the bacteria can actually start affecting the kidney tissue and ruining the kidneys. So again, make sure that you get your creatinine tested to know what your CKD stage is and your EGFR is. And remember, one is normal. Two, you've already lost half the kidney function. Now that might seem like a small change, which is why a lot of doctors miss it. Some you know, people are walking around with a creatinine of 1.2, 1.3, and that's abnormal. But many, many, many doctors will, won't even see that or tell you about it. You really want to have a creatinine that's one or less. The lower, the better. So patients can have up to 50% kidney function loss. In other words, your creatinine is two, and uh, you won't even know it. There's around 40, 40 million Americans uh, are below the water here, meaning that there's 40 million Americans with some form of kidney abnormality who don't even who don't even know it, many of them. And so it's important if your creatinine is above one to be very aware of it and to get treated and followed closely for the rest of your life. Now, diseases that affect the kidney, the most common one is diabetes. Diabetes accounts for half of the kidney disease on the earth and in America. And it does so for two reasons. One, it destroys your blood vessels. Now, not all people with diabetes this happens to, but a certain percent. So this is a nice open blood vessel. You can think of this like the pipes coming into your house. And people with diabetes, the blood vessel gets more narrow. There's fat that builds up on the wall. You can get blood clots. But the bottom line is this narrowing decreases blood flow to all organs in your body. Your heart, you can get a heart attack. Brain, you can get a stroke. Kidneys, you can get abnormal kidney function. So that's one effect, blood vessel abnormalities throughout the body, including the kidney, because every, every organ uh, gets blood from your blood vessels. And so your goal throughout your whole life is to keep your blood vessels nice and healthy. The second effect in the kidney, in addition to the blood vessels, is an effect on this structure. This is one of the million filters in your kidney. So your kidneys filter your blood and there's about a million of these in each kidney. And this is what a normal one looks like. This one on the right is what a diabetic filter looks like. And you can see it's filled up with all this junk. So these filters stop working as well. And that's a second reason why the kidney function declines. And it can decline to a point where you need to go on dialysis or get a kidney transplant. So diabetes is by far the elephant in the room. And if you, you know of someone who has kidney disease and you guess that it's diabetes, you'll be right 50% of the time. And if you go to any dialysis unit or any transplant program, half of the patients are diabetic. There are other diseases like IgA nephropathy, which is very common in Southeast Asia. And typically you get a cold or cold-like symptoms. And then after two or three days, you start peeing either bright red blood or pink urine. And this is a disease, this is one of the filters. They get very inflamed. You can see one of the filters here. It doesn't fill up with substances like diabetes. It's just, it gets filled up with a lot of cells here that come in and inflame the filter and stop it from working. You can also get kidney stones. Uh, 15 million Americans have kidney stones. This doesn't typically affect the function of the kidney, but it can if the stone is obstructing the kidney completely. Usually it causes severe pain and the pain can be worse than uh, the pain of giving birth to a baby. It's severe pain in the back that then travels around the front to the groin. And oftentimes you need morphine to stop the pain. This is another disease called polycystic kidney disease. It's a genetic disease where you get these grape-like um, protuberances from the surface of the kidney filled with fluid, sometimes blood, 
and the kidneys are quite enlarged. But five to 10% of people on dialysis have what's called polycystic kidney disease, and it's inherited from generation to generation. This is another disease called lupus. Um, again, it's an inflammatory disease of the filter. This is a normal filter. And this filter is just filled with inflammatory cells. This is a young girl with lupus. She has what's called a malar rash. And it's actually not involving the skin per se, but the blood vessels under the skin are dilated. So you're seeing actually more blood under the skin of the cheeks. And many other organs and effects can occur in lupus. This is another entity that can occur in the kidney, quite rare. This is a kidney cancer. This is a CAT scan showing this kidney with a big mass in it. This is a normal kidney here. It looks like the normal kidney looks like a horseshoe. There's about 650,000 people in the United States currently on dialysis and about 100,000 new people go from CKD5, stage five, onto dialysis. And every year, about 100,000 people pass away who are on dialysis. So the number stays roughly the same. Actually, since COVID, we're starting to see a decrease in this number for the very first time since the registry was uh, initiated in the 1970s. And that's due to a number of deaths due to COVID itself. And secondly, people are being transplanted at an earlier stage. And thirdly, we have some new drugs that are preventing people from in CKD4 and 5 from going on to dialysis. In other words, preventing them from progressing. They're sort of, they're staying at their stages longer. There's a number of reasons whether this is going to continue to occur is not clear, but clearly the trend is for this number hopefully to start decreasing over time to the point where we ultimately can either use pig kidneys as transplanted organs because there's not enough human organs or uh, utilize artificial kidneys, which my group is actually working here at UCLA on. But this number, hopefully over the next 15 to 20 years, will get down to very low numbers. And chronic dialysis and dialysis units, as we know, today will, I think, hopefully become essentially a thing of the past in the next 15, 20 years. This is hemodialysis, which utilizes uh, blood and needles that are stuck in what's called a fistula in the arm. And this is the dialyzer. Essentially, blood comes into this thing, and then we have another fluid that we put through this thing, and they're going in opposite directions. The dialysate is coming in from below. Uh, or excuse me, the dialysate is coming in from above and leaving below, and the blood from the patient is going the opposite way. And what happens is substances from the blood go into this outside solution that then just goes into the floor. So the, 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 the blood returns to the body each time it cycles through here, but the fluid that we put on the outside just comes in and leaves into the drain. And this goes on for about three to three and a half hours, three times a week. The other form of dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis, where a catheter is put into a sac in just under the abdominal wall called the peritoneal cavity. Normally this is collapsed, but you can fill it with about two liters of solution. And so what's done while the patient's sleeping is two liters is put in by the machine. It's left in for a couple hours and then it's drained and a fresh two liters is put in left in for two hours and drained, and this is all automatic. And then in the morning, the pa patient unhooks themselves and goes about their, their work. This is the type of dialysis that we recommend. It allows the patient to do it at home and not have to go to a clinic. It's done every day, so it's much more gentle than the three times a week hemodialysis. Now, the hemodialysis also can be done at home. Certain folks who can afford a technician can have one of these machines at home. You don't have to pay for the machine. The dialysis unit provides that and you keep this at home or in your office. And then you have a technician come in and hook you up. There are certain young people who hook themselves up. They put the needles in their arms themselves um, and uh, it's done uh, daily, more gently than the three times a week. 
So this is then this is called home hemodialysis. It's a much rarer procedure just because most people don't want to do it. Maybe two or three or four percent of all dialysis patients in America do home hemodialysis rather than coming to a clinic and doing it three times a week. When you get a kidney abnormality, um, it's hard to recognize unless it's quite severe, but it can manifest as fluid overload. You can also have gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea and lack of appetite. Not clear why that occurs. Your blood pressure can go up. Your blood tests will be abnormal. What we call electrolytes. These are chemical symbols for the various electrolytes. These blood tests can be abnormal. You can be anemic, as I mentioned, because you don't make erythropoietin. A number of patients are depressed on dialysis, and it may not be just because you're suddenly now not able to look after yourself normally, but you have to rely on this procedure or get a transplant. The abnormal chemistry that's part of the kidneys not working may per se cause depression. So that really has not been worked out well understood. But depression is one of the manifestations of having kidney abnormalities. There are sleep disturbances where you can't sleep at night, you sleep more during the day, and food doesn't taste the same. You could, and in addition, you lose your appetite. So it's very important when people have kidney disease to make sure you continue to eat normally, even though you don't want to eat and the food doesn't taste like it did before. So there are all sorts of tricks to enhance the taste of the food. And oftentimes you just have to eat habitually, not because you're hungry. You may not feel hungry at all. And you just have to, in a regimented way, make sure that you continue to eat well and don't, don't lose weight because then you, you'll just get sicker. But this is a common problem in patients who have a severe loss of kidney function. And as I mentioned, there are, in addition to the artificial kidney, there are a number of groups working on what are called xenotransplants. And these are transplants from a pig where the biology of the pig is changed so that the pig kidney will not be rejected at least as severely as it would otherwise. The goal is not to have a perfect transplant. The patients will still need anti-rejection medications, but the goal is to have the same anti-rejection medications that are used in a human transplant. The reason these are needed, both the artificial kidney and xenotransplants, is that there just aren't enough transplants available for the 650,000 patients that are on dialysis right now. As I say, um, there are a minimum number of people willing to donate a kidney. Those are called living transplants. And the other group are from cadaveric kidneys, patient people that have passed away. Um, there are kidneys available from that group also, but the total, the living and the cadaveric is just not enough uh, to supply the number of patients in the United States that need a kidney transplant. So these other modes of renal replacement therapy are being actively worked on. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to, to address them. <laughs>